Afade Toto Samzu, uh, non CJ. I live in Bonnie Lake, Washington, and I was born in Guam and I lived in Talafofo till I was around six. And I've been living out here for about 26 years now. Afade Toto Samzu, Guahu Sealena Aflagui Arroyo. I have been living on Ohlone land, also known as the Bay Area, for about 23 years now. Um, I come from Familian Eka from my Bla side and Familian Kantun from my Inalahan side. Um, very happy to be here with all of you and share dialogue. Afade uh, Toto Samzu, Guahu Si Richard. Um, I'm currently in San Diego, California lived here most of my life and uh yeah sorry about the name i couldn't change that (laughs) (laughs) hey hey the name suits you primu all right so so let's get straight into business just for our viewers right now so first of all the term diaspora do you guys like the term diaspora do you like it when you're referred to as part of the Samoru diaspora does it Bother you or not, and 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 we'll start with uh, we'll start with uh, uh, see Alyssa. <laughs> uh, for me personally, uh, the first time I heard that was probably uh, what's that four years ago when they had a uh, um, best pack on Guam. So that's the first time I've actually heard that like terminology. Um, but for me, it doesn't bother me. Um, I guess I just don't put like any, any weight into the, that term. Right. So, cause I, I've always, I was raised with, uh, you know, within the hula community. And so I've always gone, kind of gone by this, this, uh, reference that wherever I walk, my people walk, right. I learn, I am tomorrow. And so as long as I keep my foundation solid within myself and I don't pay any heed to that, You know, for me, I feel like diaspora is just a fancy word for displaced. Um, And, you know, we use the the term diaspora for many different communities, um, whether that's the Pacific Islander community or the African community or the Latinx community. And so for me, I, I didn't really get exposed to what diaspora, like the word diaspora really meant until I was probably in college um, and so to, to identify as like a part of di- the diaspora hasn't really been like a part of my identity until my, my elder or not elder, my, my, as I've gotten older. Um, and so I think, you know, to, to be a part of the diaspora for me, um, it, it is a part of an identity, you know, our, our experiences in the continental U.S. are very different and our way of navigating through, um, this different type of worlds or these different systems that we're exposed to or different communities that we um, are um, exposed to, it it is a different experience. And I think it's really important for us to acknowledge that and to acknowledge the privileges that come with being from the diaspora. And I have air quotes around that. Um, (laughs) And also the privileges of it, of being born and raised on Guahan, being born and raised in the Marianas. and, And what is that experience? Um, so yeah thank you for sharing that thank you for sharing those thoughts and what about you cj yeah i i kind of like the the other two diaspora is not a term that i've really been exposed to i mean i think maybe about two years ago the first time i had really seen that in reference to um specifically chamorus and just um you know like elena was saying just kind of understanding how that is used in a lot of different communities um one of the things, you know, it does it does make us a sort of subgroup of another group, and I do think that is important. I think specifically when we, uh, you know, if we take it like an intersectional look at it, you know, if we uh, our experience our our experiences are going to be different than our brothers and sisters back home versus in the states. You know, there are there are definitely different challenges and. Um, different roadblocks as well as like like you said a a lot of privileges that can come with it um you know i think it is it's an important term i think it's important to understand it and uh, it's also important to understand that you know that it doesn't make us any less or more chamoru or you know anything like that than uh you know than if we were back home but yeah 
So would you would you say then, CJ, that that you have embraced the term diaspora? Yeah, I, I think so. You know, it, it's not something I would, you know, I'm not going to say like, ah, oh, hi, I'm CJ, I'm Chamoru diaspora, um, you know, but <laughs> seeing it, it's also something that I think does does sort of help with any sort of negative experiences, seeing the experiences of other diaspora from other cultures, like understanding that our experience isn't necessarily fully unique and being able to, you know, stand in solidarity or have people, you know, stand in solidarity with us when we have, you know, experiences like that. Um, but I definitely, definitely have embraced it. What about you, Elena? Would you say you embrace the term as well? You know, I, that, that's a really good question. I don't, I don't necessarily know if I embrace it. Um, I, I acknowledge it that I am tomorrow from the diaspora. Um, and also I just, I love what CJ said about, it doesn't necessarily make us any less tomorrow or any bet. Like we're not better because we're from the diaspora, but I, I do use it when I, when I speak on my experiences because it is very different and, um, it's important to, to, to recognize what this type of experience is like. Um, yeah. Thank you. What about you, Rich? Have you embraced the term diaspora? Do you agree with what they said or do you think they're just all wrong? Uh, you know, I don't refer to myself as a diaspora, like I said earlier, but, um, you know, if that's a terminology that someone wants to use, I guess if that makes them, uh, label me a little bit more or better for themselves. Sure. But, you know, um, yeah, I just don't put that label as the one that us here are diaspora. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah, no, of course. Feel free. I also, you know, I, I just want to, to recognize and acknowledge that in some ways I have, I have found that by embracing diaspora or, continuing to kind of acknowledge this difference also um, can also contribute to our, our division, right? As Chamorro people by recognizing like, oh, you're different because you're from the diaspora or you're different because you're, you live and you've been born and raised in the Marianas, which of course we want to recognize the, the differences of the experiences. And also, right, like how, how do we use those, those differences to, to come together and learn from each other? And to to find a way to reconnect with with our families and with our our relatives and our brothers and sisters of Guahan of the Marianas, right? So that's just something that I wanted to to bring bring up real quick. Got you. Yeah, you're definitely you're definitely right about that. Like, I I mean, you guys growing up in the states, probably you know, I had the experience of going to family parties and things like that or having relatives visit and getting together with a lot of people who may have been in the states a lot less longer than our family had been and you know like i went to a really all i went to an all white pretty much all white school so i generally grew up with the feeling that i wasn't like white enough for the white kids and then i'd go to these chumoru parties but like i had been fairly isolated from the culture and my own people you know i'd show up and i'd feel like am I like, am I Chamorro enough to be around these people? Like, am I going to fit in here? Like, I don't know any Chamorro. I don't have an accent. Like, I don't know what some of this, these things, these dishes are called. I feel, you know, I think I was the first time my dad had me amen people at a party. I mean, I was like sweating. I was like, what the heck? How am I supposed to do this? Um, <laughs> you know, and I, I think uh, you're, you're definitely right that like that, that sort of distinction and that label can, you know, even if it is like within those moments, like I self-imposed that on myself. Like nobody was telling me like, you're not tomorrow enough to be here, son. Like that's, that wasn't, that wasn't a thing. I was always welcomed with open arms, but um, yeah, 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 Elena, you're, you're definitely, definitely right about the, uh, you know, the, the possible division that can come from that. Uh, can I just yeah. go say something real quick in response no, to that? Sure. I guess, um, I guess I was lucky enough now thinking about it. I was lucky enough to be in San Diego where our Chamorro community is really thick and bonded. Um, cause we have the sons and daughters of Guam club. We have a pretty frequent 
uh, meetups. Um, so I, I guess I just never thought about it in that aspect. If you're in Washington for like, like CJ just said, um, where the, maybe the community is, isn't as strong. Um, but like I said, here in San Diego, our Pacific Island community is really, I mean, they're pretty bonded and, and, and I guess I was just fortunate enough to, to live in that, live in this place. Oh, gotcha. No, no, that, that's a, that's a, that's a good point. I actually have never thought about that too, how the, the individual communities there, depending on where you're at, where you have a lot of Chamorro communities there will help maintain your connection to, to the, the homeland. And, and this leads into the next topic I want to talk about, which is this. So, so for you, Elena, have you ever felt that your chamorro that your Chamorro identity, that it was sort of inauthenticated or illegitimate because you lived most of your life in the States rather than in the Marianas? You know, I, I was very privileged and very blessed to grow up with um, a, a rich family in terms of how we've been able to talk story and, and carry our, um, our experiences with us. Um, and I have a lot of family in, in the States um, who are tomorrow and a lot of family also back home on Guahan. So I, I've never seen myself as not holding an authentic Chamorro identity and and what what really is an authentic Chamorro identity, right? Like our our identities are constantly evolving, especially when we are displaced from our homeland. You know, having to really navigate these multiplicities of of who we are and how how do we really sustain and take pride in who we are living in such a a diverse country and being very marginalized in that space and very invisibilized. Native Pacific Islanders make up a very small percentage of the population. So I think living in the diaspora, living in the States, um, I, yeah, I, I was very blessed to, to have my stories of, of our creators, of um, our experiences on the island shared with me. And so, and my family on Guahan, they are very close in communicating with us too. And whenever I have gone back on island, um, being able to, to share space with them and live with them um, has really helped me in understanding where I come from. Um, and this is just my experience. Every Chamorro has their own experience with their families or with where they live. Um, or with how they understand who they are. And so I am very um, grateful for that. And it's constantly evolving. You know, it's, we're always learning more about who we are and, and um, who we come from. So, yeah. No, that's good. What, what about you, CJ? What, would you like to share your thoughts on that question too? What do you, have you ever felt that you're, identity was inauthenticated because you lived there in the States rather than the Marianas? I have, but that was uh, kind of like, unlike the other thing I was talking about, that wasn't really self-imposed. Um, you know, like I had said, you know, I went to, I went to a really small um, all white school, um, which is, which is, it's unfortunate that I was disconnected from the culture for so long because the, Chamoru communities within like Federal Way and Tacoma out here um, are are really strong. Um, you know, this it was just something that like our family just ha- wasn't doing at that point. Um, but you know, culture and identity that wasn't white American was was something that was definitely put down um, at my old school. Um, it wasn't something that I really felt personally like on my own. It wasn't this idea that I had kind of fostered in my own head, but kind of hearing repeatedly like, oh, you're from Guam. Well, you don't actually live there. So what's the difference? What's, how do you, what, what makes you different than us? What are you like? What's so special about you? Um, You know, and through that, it, it, it was something that sort of became, I was, you know, I was otherized through it. It was, you know, it was, it was colonizer language that I had, you know, eventually gotten to the point where uh, I, I kind of disconnected myself from it because I started to view myself as an inauthentic Chamoru, like not really Chamoru, um, you know, and I didn't have the strongest connection in the first place, but it's something that I, you know, around 
two and a half, three years ago, I really started to try to try to get back into, you know, it was, uh, I, I, I got a recommendation randomly on YouTube for Chamoru song. And that's kind of like what I, I, it was something, it was, uh, it was, uh, Corona and Flores by, uh, Tinapu. And I was in my, in my truck when I worked for FedEx and I was like sobbing because we used to listen to that song a lot growing up. And we used to all sing along in Chamoru and like my mom used to sing us Chamoru songs and stuff. And like, that really took me back. And I was like, wow, I need to, I need to like really reconnect with this, this lost, I, this lost identity I have, you know, this, this culture that I've, you know, completely let go of. Um, but yeah, I've, I've definitely felt the, the sort of uh, inauthentic identity uh, in my life. So do Masi but uh sharing that now it's uh golf uh time out now how night to share that it's very golf met good golf met good easy and gambu and see see rich have you faced any similar experiences as uh, see cj or see elena or you know or have you just have a totally different experience <laughs> um so being being islander when i was younger i was always proud of right so My grandparents would go back to Guam or, um, you know, my aunts would, you know, on Guam would send me a bunch of Chamorro gear, or Guam gear. So I had like a big Guam pendant around my neck. I had uh, bamboo earrings. I had, yeah, I mean, I had it all. And so I, I wanted people to know that was from Guam. I wanted people to know that. And I had to explain it. Um, but I think I've told you this before, uh, which is probably the dumbest explanation ever, is that when people say, you know, where's Guam? I would say, you know, well, do you know where Hawaii is? It's like that kind of, but it's just further. So, um, and it wasn't until I was 18 when I went to Guam for the first time where I connected the two differences of just being Chamorro and knowing what that means to be Chamorro. So uh, I had a better understanding of, of who I was as a, or what the, the meaning Chamorro actually meant for me. And, um, and then just kind of just did, did more research, wanted to find out more about my people. Um, but it was never like someone was throwing it out there for me. Um, at least I don't recall that, you know, I don't recall people uh, trying to inauthenticate who I was or anything like that. So, and I mean, I'm a pretty loud person, so uh, I'll make it, <laughs> I'll make it well known that you, sh you shouldn't uh, put me down. So, <laughs> So, so you mentioned, you know, you're, you're find out what does it mean to be Chamorro, right? You said that. So for you, what then, what then does it mean to be Chamorro for you personally? Now or, or when I was younger? You know what? When you were younger and now. <laughs> uh, so when I was younger, it was, you know, knowing the history, knowing some of the myths, like Chief Godow and, and um, the stories of our, our uh, chiefs. Um, Uh, really knowing about like cockfighting back on Guam, uh, going to the, like all the beaches, the tourist spots and, and where the cool spots were. Um, but I think now it's more about language, history. Um, I learned a lot of like things to, uh, I learned a lot from your channel and then I look more in depth, you know, like where, what that all means. And so, and being tomorrow also means like for, you know, the younger generation that, you know, my grandfather's generation doesn't pass on with, the, with, uh, the identity being left, you know, um, my kids learning tomorrow, learning how to cook the food, learning the history, learning the stories. Um, I mean, then tells a lot, you know, so a lot more in depth, I would say a lot more, uh, true passion for the culture. Seduce Masi and see Elena for you, what does it mean to be Samoru? Wow. Um, well, if I think back to when I was younger, um, my mom always, I remember back in the day when I was in like second grade or something. And I also went to a very predominantly white school growing up um, during like culture day. My, yeah, my mom very much instilled in me, like you're, we're going to talk about Putna and Puntan and we're going to talk about our creators. And that was, that was my way of really understanding where I came from is through those stories and through those legends and 
um, just really being told our, our legends of Serena and the Duendes and my great grandfather was a huge cockfighter. So <laughs> um, just understanding and listening and really cherishing those memories that, that my family um, had of Guam and my great grandmother, what her life was like living on island and going through the States when my great grandfather was in the Navy. Um, and so growing up, similar, similar to Rich, um, I, my first time um, actually going, going on island, I was 17. And that was kind of where I was able to really understand what it meant to, to be on islands, to have these stories that I've heard growing up really come to life, and to really see it right in front of my face. And that was really what politicized me and to see what, what is happening to our island, what is happening to our people. Um, so, and since then, um, I feel that when it comes to my Chamorro identity, it's been how, how have we been able to sustain ourselves and really, um, revitalize and to keep our culture alive through our language, through learning our history, learning our values as a people and, um, bringing that into our youth and bringing that knowledge into tomorrow's who live in the States and, and how can we understand the complexities of our island and support our island in our process of really experiencing and having agency over what happens to our people and what happens to our island. So that that's what it means for me as of right now. <laughs> and um, just really cherishing our elders and cherishing their, their stories because um, they're very valuable and they, they, they have so much, um, so much love in them too. You, you mentioned this in your, your earlier answer, which was you put air quotes, authentic Chamorro identity. So would you consider there to be an authentic Chamorro identity you know, I don't know. <laughs> That's I, I'm not sure if I have an answer to that question. Um, I think when it when it comes to any culture, any any group of people, um, what does it mean to be authentic? Right? Is authenticity does it mean being fluent in our language? Does it mean knowing every single recipe of our food? Does it mean wearing our traditional adornment every day? For some, yeah, I, I totally agree with that. And for some, maybe it's not. Maybe it's navigating how, how to really just stay in touch with who we are in the States or learning about it. Um, it's a journey for everyone. And yeah, I think, I think authenticity is a really tricky term um, because who, who gets to define what's authentic? Right? Mm, that's, a, that's a good point right there. And what about you, CJ? What do you, for you, what do you consider to be Chamorro? What does it mean to be Chamorro? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I, I like the answers of, you know, knowing, knowing legends, knowing our stories, knowing our history. And um, as, as somebody who's, you know, I've been disconnected from a lot of that, like this, this book has been kind of like my, my lifesaver, just <laughs> learning, you know, being able to, yeah. Oh my God. You know, reading, being able to read the stories that like, you know, because growing up, I basically only heard Bible stories and things like that, or like American history. Um, so being able to, to read these stories that maybe I'd heard of, maybe I'd never heard of in my life, um, was definitely a big part in kind of like getting some of that back and learning the language is also a really big part of it. Um, you know, and like these two have said, it's it's going to be different from person to person. It's going to be different week to week, day to day, year to year. Um, you know, and a big part of it for me is, is taking part in cultural practices like, like Tensuli, like, like mutual aid and things like that. Um, that is something that I find so just intrinsic to what it means to be a Chamorro, you know, helping, helping everybody you can, um, you know, and that's something like, like my, I've seen my parents do my whole life. And, um, it's, it's an attitude that when learning about the culture, you know, I think like they do this because they're good people. And I think they also do it because like, that's just, you know, part of who we are as people is to, is to do things like that. Um, so, you know, that is a big part of my, of my central identity as a Chamorro and, and what that means to me. 
And and see, CJ, you you mentioned that how you grew up in a predominantly white school. So were there any experiences or instances where one of those white kids or even a teacher was like, hey, are you Mexican or are you a Latino? You speak Spanish. What are you? (laughs) Yeah, um, that happens a lot. I mean, growing up in the school and the church I did, um, that I grew up in, I did get that a lot. Typically from people who knew us, you know, that wasn't a question, but um, new members or people I'd never met before, I mean, always being asked. I mean, even, even like a couple of days ago at work, it happened to me, you know, somebody said something about speaking Spanish and asked me if I knew Spanish. And I was like, I, I don't, I'm, I, I don't know Spanish. I'm not, I'm not Hispanic. Um, uh, it does, it does happen. Uh, it doesn't happen as much anymore. Um, it happens a lot when I, it happens a lot less when I have facial hair. Um, <laughs> but it, it definitely does happen from time to time. And, and what's your, your most funniest experience or most memorable experience of that happening where someone basically misidentified you? Um, yeah, when my, when my wife and I got married, we, we honeymooned in um, Cabo. And so we stayed at a hotel where, you know, most of the, uh, most of the workers there spoke Spanish and they had these golf carts where, you know, you'd get from point A to point B on the resort. And we hopped in a golf cart and the fella turns around and asks me where we want to go in Spanish. And I look at my wife and she looks back at me and I respond. I say, you know, hablo Espanol. And he just laughed at me and then asked me again in Spanish. Cause he just like, he's like, yeah, okay, dude. Um, and I think he asked me a total of like two or three times with without relenting and I, I kept saying in Eng- I switched to English I was like maybe he doesn't believe me because I'm saying it in Spanish um you know but I switched to English and I, maybe he finally believed me or you know just gave up because I was annoying who knows <laughs> <laughs> thank you for sharing that and and so for you Elena and this is an interesting thing too because you're you're of correct me if I'm wrong but you're of the the mixed cultural heritage too. So, so how, how do you navigate that and your Shamor identity with those other cultural heritages? Yeah, thank you so much for asking that question. Um, so yes, I am Chamorro. Um, I'm also Mexican and Puerto Rican. So when I get asked that question, I, I mean, that, that's what I am. So <laughs> um, for me, it's just like, yeah, I'm, I'm Mexican and Puerto Rican. But um, you know, a lot of a lot of Chamorros in the states, and a lot of my family members are are mixed. There's a lot of Chamorros in the states who are mixed with with being Mexican or being of Latin um, descent, or being mixed with Filipino, being mixed with, with many different things. And so, when I get asked that question, um, yeah, I I think it. I always obviously say yes, um, but I think it's also a matter of wh- which communities do we feel the most comfortable in too. Um, and for me, being half Latina um, of Puerto Rican and Mexican descent, um, I have grown up with more stories and more um, historical knowledge from my family of being Chamorro. So I feel most comfortable around Native Pacific Islander um communities when it comes to how I feel a sense of community um but but yeah my my Spanish isn't it, it's good <laughs> but it's not it's not the best <laughs> but yeah that that's just my experience being being mixed and being able to navigate those those very different complexities and also acknowledging that a lot of Chamorros in the diaspora are mm. are descent as well Seduce Masi, because actually we have my primo here, Rich, who's also your primo. He he's also uh, what do you call it? He's also a mixed cultural heritage because his dad is uh, Samoan. Uh, would you like to speak on that, uh, see Rich? Um, yeah, I'm probably as islander as they get. I'm Samoan, Hawaiian, and Chamorro. Um, but I mainly grew up with my Chamorro side. So, but I also did, I was in a dance group when I was 15. And so that kind of helped me navigate through like a lot of questions I might've had about um, culture, community. Um, but that was my main com- community was Pacific Islanders. Um, you know, I didn't, 
I, like I said, uh, we're lucky enough to be in, in San Diego where the, the community is just really big. You know, we have the biggest Pacific Islander festival in, in the United States here in San Diego. I mean, there's multiple dance groups here. It's just, you know, it's a little Island away from, from the islands. So I, I think that's where I, I luck out at. And plus I got you. <laughs> Well, would you say anyone has ever confused you for like, uh, like, hey, that guy? Oh yeah. A- well, oh, so yeah. I'm not like a, I'm not like a giant Samoan guy, you know, or, or you know, Islander. I'm only like five nine, but uh, yeah, I get Mexican a lot. Uh, I think today someone asked me if I was from Pakistan. Literally <laughs> today, uh, so I get I get a bunch of different races just depending on what I how my hair looks if I grow my afro out if I don't grow my afro out. Um, yeah, I get it all the time. Gotcha. And do you feel do you feel like, man, do you like feel bad when that happens or you just accept it as it is? It is what it is. Oh, yeah. I mean, I just accept, you know, people. I don't get offended because people just some people just don't know here. So it's my job to kind of, you know, explain to them what I am. And, and if they have questions about that, then I'm, I'm OK with, quest, uh, you know, uh, giving them those answers. Um you know, I might make some bad assumptions myself. So, you know, like, I uh, like, yeah. So I don't, I don't really get offended by it. Gotcha. Gotcha. And so you said that when you were 18, that's when you first came to Guam, correct? So, yeah. So for you, you know, I, I'm assuming that all of you have this, this desire, these personal feelings that, you know, you, you always want to return to the Marianas. You always want to return to Guahan or Saipa or, or wherever in the Mariana. So how do you like reconcile these feelings of wanting this longing of going home with the fact that you grew up and you live there in the States? So just starting with you, Richard. Um, so I like going back to the islands every two years. Uh, Guam takes a little longer. because Obviously it's not as uh, cost effective. Um especially with the big family that I have, you know, so, but, you know, I just haven't really, as long as I'm able to go back there to Hawaii, uh, Samoa or Guam every once in a while, reconnect and get my mind moving a little bit. Um, you know, I don't know, feed my soul, I guess you would say, um, get back to, you know, seeing the family, the roots, then I'm okay with coming back to the States for now. I'm not sure that later in life that, you know, I don't retire back on Guam or, or Hawaii or wherever it might be, but um, I'm okay being here in the, in the meantime, because we also have the dance group that we have out here in San Diego. So um, like, I feel decently well-connected where I'm not feeling like I'm, I'm missing out on, on anything too, you know, uh, critical at the moment. Uh, not that to say that that doesn't hit, when I go to Guam and I come back and two months later, I feel like I need to go back right away. Uh, I do have those like moments where I get like kind of homesick feelings. Um, but I just know that there's, there's work I have to do personally in, in, in the state still. So I'm okay with that. That's where I reconcile it all. Gotcha. It's too smossy. And what about for you, Elena? Yeah. So, um, it's great. My, my grandmother's sister, she just moved back home to Guahan after living in the States for a long period of her life. And so I, I think for, for a lot of us, and I don't want to generalize, but I feel that a lot of Chamorros out in the States have this inherent like mahaling for going back and for, for returning back. And also what, what's the role in like having land too, right? like having the privilege of having land back home and being able to um, to build off of that and to be in connection to. And so um, my dream is to, is to go back, um, is to retire there, is to live a good life with my family. Um, and I, I, I can say that I feel that a lot of Chamorros feel that sense as well. Um, being away is really hard. I've only... I've only been on island twice, um, but leaving each time was very difficult. And immediately after, I wanted to go back. 
And, you know, that that's where that's where we're from. That's where our ancestors are from. And so it's natural for us to gravitate towards that and to want to return um, in any type of capacity. Um, and like Rich said, it's it's really expensive. It's hard for for a lot of us to go back to visit. A lot of us have settled here, have grown families, too. Um, but ultimately, I, I think for for most of us, we, we'd love to go back eventually. Situs Masi Parasharina now. And and for you, CJ. Yeah, it's it's definitely uh, it's definitely something I think about a lot. Um the last time I went back was when I was 18, right after I graduated high school. So going on seven years now. Um since I've been back. I, I think about going back all the time. I want to take my wife back, uh, who was born and raised in Washington, never never felt warm ocean water in her life. Um, so, you know, that's, that's something I think about a lot. I, I also, you know, I think about the possibilities of, you know, of retiring, of, of, of going back, you know, to our family land in Talafofo and, 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 you know, working on the land show and things like that. I, you know, I've got, um, it, you know, and it depends on the day. Sometimes it really stings, you know, some days I'm sitting at my desk, I have a poster or I have a canvas of Talafofo uh, Bay above my desk. And sometimes I'm listening to uh, uh Hao Guahan and I look up and I'm, you know, Gulf, Gulf Mahaling Zoo, <laughs> uh, you know, and I'm, I'm holding back tears cause I, cause I miss it. You know, I want to, you know, I want to go back and, um, you know, I think one of the things, uh, you know, to think about, I guess, is, is the is the how you know like i that's that is something i would love to do like it's it would be incredible but you know it's how how would i do that you know we we do have we do have family land but you know how you know getting a job you know flying out there for goodness sake just looking at tickets for my wife and i is is already expensive enough rich i couldn't imagine i mean for a whole family i mean even for even for four people it'd be you know it'd be out of this world expensive but it's it's something important to me and i think how i reconcile that is um trying to understand what's happening back home um you know part of it you know just understanding like any sort of land struggles like what what's happening with latixan and things like that um you know and not just the negative, but even 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 positive things like like having a poster of Talafofo Bay above above my above my desk keeps me connected. It keeps me um, it keeps me rooted, I guess. You know, in in understanding of what's what's happening and and where I come from. Realistically, you know, I, that's uh, that's kind of how I kind of how I do it, I guess. And and for you, how important for you personally? How important would you say is trying to make an effort to visit, to live in the Barianas, to your Chamorro identity? To my identity, I would say it's of like medium importance. Um, you know, kind of like we were talking about earlier, um, where I am in the world doesn't necessarily make or break my identity. Um, you know, where you know, where, wherever, uh, wherever I am, I'm still Chamorro. You know, um, one of the things I really love is like, uh, you know, Guma Imanyelu is, you know, home, it's house of siblings. I, I, you know, which was the understanding I came, came to, you know, figure out a while ago. And, um, you know, I feel like wherever we are, you know, if that's, if that's some place I can call home, if I have the people I love, if I have, you know, my culture that I can celebrate, you know, that is, that is my home wherever I am. If I'm in Guam, if I'm in Washington, if I'm in Sweden, you know, I am, I'm still, uh, through and through Chamorro. I'm still, uh, that's, that's still a central part of my identity. Gotcha. Thank you. And what about you, Elena? What are your thoughts? Yeah, I would honestly just really echo what CJ was saying. Um, I feel that no matter where where we are in the world, we still find a way to to stay connected, whether that is through song, whether that is through having a photo um, or through cooking. Um, and so for me, I from the times that I have been on island, um, 
it was it was just different. It was a different type of connection um, that I felt I wasn't able to get in the States for myself. And that was just seeing family every day. That's just going on a hike to a sacred site and being able to connect with my ancestors in that way. Um, that is really difficult to do in the States. And um, that's something that I very much value and I hold really dear to my heart. Um, so for me, I, I don't think living on island would necessarily make me feel any more tomorrow, um, but it would definitely help in allowing me to understand um, how connected I am to the land and um, reminding myself that the land is inherently who we are and being away from it is really challenging and connecting in that way for myself. Got you. So the, so, the, so if I, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's sort of like a means to help you express and connect with your tomorrow identity rather than being the cause of your, okay, got you. And, and what about you, Rich? How, how important would you say is, you know, at least making an effort or living in the Marianas to your tomorrow identity? Uh, yes, yeah, kind of the same. I think uh, like what they're saying and I, what I said in the beginning is where I am is, you know, that's part of me, the identity of my tomorrow people, right? So cooking the food and the language, <clears throat> I can only say... That when I when I go back to Guam, when I've been back to Guam the three times, um, yeah, you feel like you're at home, right? Everything feels a little bit more natural for me. Um, like from the first time I went to Guam to now, I can definitely understand tomorrow ten times easier, hundred times easier than I used to be able to. I can listen to everyone talk and I can pick up um, like most of the words to under understand what they're saying to me. Uh, I think the only thing that I love when I go back to Guam is that I dive deeper into the culture. Uh, I learn a lot more, a lot faster. Um, you know, last time we were there, went to the Amut farm, went to Latexan, um, went to the museum. Uh, we hung out a couple of times, uh, you know, like, and it's just, it's just all around you. Right. So it's so much easier to grasp things when it's all around you at all, all the time in all angles. And when it's back here, you know, it's a slower, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's the States and you're not going to get, you know, those tomorrow moments with people all the time. You're, you're mainly, you know, moving that fast paced life and going to work and trying to figure out where you fit in your culture learning. And it's hard. It, it's, it really is hard. And so that's what I'll, I would say is if I was, I was, back home on Guam or Saipan, um, you know, I think it'd be a lot easier just to learn everything I really want to learn um, in a shorter amount of time. Sissi Samasi for sharing that, especially about your experience, your first experiences coming here. How about you, Elena? Would you like to share your experiences when you were here as well? Any memorable moments or funny stories or anything? Yeah, um, you know, it's funny, my first time on island, I think the one thing I really wanted to do was go to a cockfight. <laughs> I just, you know, I grew up with those stories of my great grandfather. And I was like, you know, I really wanted to see a cockfight. Um, <laughs> but one of one of the most beautiful memories that I have um, is actually my, my aunt and um, some relatives of mine, we, we took a hike to Haputo. And oh my gosh, it was that was the first time I think I've really indulged myself in being present with the land that we come from and seeing the Lottie stones that were still standing and seeing just all the, the history in one place and in one setting was just so beautiful. And and in that moment, I, I really did feel the the strong like presence of of my ancestors, of, of our ancestors. And um, yeah, so just being able to have access to that is so important. And with Lectexen, 
and with um, just all of our sacred sites that are so at risk right now. Um, our sacred sites are so important in us really being able to hold that relationship with who we are and, and where we come from and all of the, the knowledge that we hold. And so, yeah, just being able to, to be in that space and to, to be present in that moment was really, really life-changing for me. So, so you would say there's a difference between the land you're in currently versus the land which is in Guahan, correct? Oh, absolutely. And, you know, we, we live on native land, right? So everywhere is indigenous land, no matter where we are in the world. And so um, there is, a, there is a, a sacred energy with, with where we are too um, in the States, but, but to be from Guahan and to be from the Marianas, it's, it's a different connection because that, that's where we come from. And um, yeah, it's, we, we literally like we derive from the land. And so to be in strong connection to it is really important for myself, um, not just the land, but also, yeah, the, the ocean and the air and the wind and all, and all that comes with, with the earth too. Got you. Situ Samasi for sharing. And what about you, uh, CJ? Well, do you have any memories or that you want to explicitly share or any funny things about when you first came here to Guam, when you first visited? Uh, I mean, a funny thing was my, all my, all my, and he's calling me uh, Palazzo Americano <laughs> oh all the time, God. all the time. Oh, they know, they know American boy all the time. I couldn't stop hearing it for what I kind of visited when I was 10. And then I visited <laughs> again when I was, when I was 18. Um, I think a really, a really salient memory um, kind of going off of what Rich said, you know, about um, things just moving slower. Uh, you know, I remember after, we, we had dinner, we had a party and the sun was setting, you know, it was in at my, my family's house in Talafofo. And I was like, what do you guys want to do now? And they were like, this is what we're doing. And we were just hanging out, watching the sunset. Um, you know, there was no pretense of like all these things we got to do. There, there wasn't this, this awful awful mindset of like we have to fill every second of time we have with something productive um you know i, I was there at when I, after i graduated i was i was i visited home for three months so you get used to the flow of time you get used to the way of life and i came back and i got a job and i you know the thing i just kept saying I'm like why, why is the world in such a rush all the time like everywhere you go, you, you can't get away from it. And that's, that is, that is something like anytime I'm frustrated with having too little time in my day, you know, I, I have an hour commute to work. So I get home and I have like three hours before I have to go to sleep here. Um, and uh, I always think about that when I'm, when I'm really frustrated, I'm like, you know, like, wow, like I really miss that. It's a way of, it's a way of sort of coping with it, but um it's it's a it's a really sweet memory that i hold on to that we just you know at the end of the day after all was said and done after being as busy as we were and there was a lot more stuff to do that everybody just was in agreement that we were just gonna watch the sunset and laugh and you know drink and eat past one in the morning being really loud you know no neighbors yelling over the fence or anything um you know that's a really really sweet memory that i hold on to Anyone want to comment on that or reflect or add anything? Uh, no, I mean, I just bring a smile to my face because I'm still imagining myself right now <laughs> down at, uh, in, in Iran, just hanging out, drinking and being loud. It's fun. <laughs> yeah. And I think also just being um, in American culture, Right, like we're so consumed by this capitalistic world <laughs> and just always being on the go all the time, um, having to survive through that as well. And so sometimes I feel I myself like forget, like, okay, let's just take a pause and let's just be present in the moment. And sometimes what what I've experienced being on island is 
that exact experience is being present, really appreciating the moments that we have with our family and appreciating the different experiences that, that we're creating and the memories that we're creating with each other. Um, so that's what I really appreciate about being back home. And um, it's funny how we always like Guam is always home, right? The islands are always home for us. Um, even growing up and having my family on islands saying like, oh, when are you going to come back home? Or so just normalizing that and always seeing our, our homeland as as home. Got you. And that's, man, that's just so interesting. All of you sharing the same experiences, all of you coming to Guam at the same time to win around 17, 18 too. That's just, wow, I couldn't have planned this any better. So, you know, we're running out of time. So here's just the last question I just want to ask you all. But but first, CJ, let me just comment that, hey, you know, your auntie said they call you, what's it, a, a Poasso Americano? Hey, I still get called that. <laughs> <laughs> I still get caught that. <laughs> so, so let me just ask and I'll, I'll be like this, you know, what do you wish that Samoru's who are living in the homeland in the Marianas would know about you, about Samoru's in the diaspora? So, well, wh whoever could start first, feel, feel free. Yeah, I think, um, something to keep in mind um it's an attitude that i've had to sort of uh, adopt with i mean with any topic with with politics with anything i do is um remembering uh people don't know what they don't know um you know if you meet if you meet a chamoru and they seem really disconnected from their culture um you know take into take into account, you know, maybe the circumstances one grew up in, um, you know, they might have grown up in the middle of Wisconsin and been the only Chamorro for 500 miles, um, you know, or like my own experience being in a, being in a really small general white population and in, in a, in a, in a school, in a church, um, you know, just kind of being separated and isolated from that. Um, and, approaching that with you know and i think i think it's more the minority than anything i i have i have yet to see people you know we don't i don't see a lot of gatekeepers in our in our cultural community i don't see a lot of people who are like well you're not chamaru enough how big is your sanahi nobody's like that um you know people, people i i have yet to see anything like that but you know approaching those sort of situations those people um you know, with, with love, with respect and with an attitude of, um, you know, an attitude that can foster and, uh, culture, you know, uh, cultivate an appreciation and a, and a love of our culture. Um, you know, that's, I've had people take that approach with me. Um, you know, and I've, I've even taken that approach with, with people, um, you know, and I guess something to keep in mind is, uh, you know, we are trying, we are, we are trying to reconnect to our roots. You know, every day I am continually trying to reroute myself in the, you know, proverbial soil of my homeland. Um, you know, it's, it's something I keep in mind. It's something that I, I try to even just little, little words, little terms and things like that, working into conversations, trying to, you know, foster my own, my own culture, um, every day within my conversations and in my actions and things like that. Um, but yeah, you know, I guess if you just to cap it off, I guess, you know, if you, if you do think somebody is maybe disconnected from the culture, help try to help reconnect them to it, you know, is maybe, maybe it's awkward. Maybe, maybe you're not very connected with the culture, you know, but giving, giving resources or, um, sharing things with them you know that's a big one there's a a friend i've made on social media pretty recently over the past couple months where you know like i've shared your channel with him um i've shared the fanatsu podcast i've shared chamori music chamori music with him because he's grown up completely isolated from it and it's really helped him sort of like foster 
that sort of identity, um, you know, and, and a love for where he comes from and who he is as a true Moro. Yeah, thank you for that, CJ. Um, I would love to echo a lot of what you said. Um, I think for me, um, just having a strong relationship between Chamorros on island and Chamorros in the diaspora, because there's so much that we can learn from each other. And for the Chamorros out in the diaspora who may identify as Guamanian and may not know the difference between Guamanian or Chamorro or who gravitate towards Polynesian culture because Micronesian culture is not really visibilized in the States as much. Um, just to, to hold our values dear to our heart and to move with that um, with respect and enough of outlook for um, those who are in their journeys of understanding what it means to be Chamorro for them. Um, and just within the past few years, just from what I've observed, we've been able to really connect ourselves back home um, through the help of the language courses, the Chamorro language courses that Dr. Bavakwa has accessible for, for many folks or um, through the podcast. And so these are really great ways for us to share with our community out here in the States to connect themselves more with who they are and and their identities and um, what it means for them to be Chamorro. Um, and, and yeah, so I think to really carry our values with us and to move with grace um, towards those who are still in their, in their journeys of understanding who they are. Oh, um, I guess that leads to me. Um, I think, you know, I would just want people back on, on Guam, on home, you know, uh, just understand that we're, we're just as passionate about our culture out here and care about the land out here um, just as much as anybody else does back on Guam. You know, we may not be, have, be able to um, access the same resources and things like that, but, you know, maybe that's where you guys come in to help. You know, maybe that's where you start putting out some information that we might want. Uh, one thing I love back home that I wish I had here is just those certain expertise, people who are of expertise in like blacksmithing, Amun farm. I wish I had more information on things like that. And if you could provide that in some shape or form, I mean, that'd be great. I mean, I just haven't found too many resources on things like that. And I don't know if that's, you know, necessarily something you can do, um, you know, via the web, but it'd be awesome just to have some books and things to read like that. Um, yeah, I think it's just, it's all about helping, right? We're all here in the same mission and preserve the culture, make sure that, you know, our, um, our history isn't lost anywhere. So that's all I got, you know, just be uh, helpful. No judgmentals. <laughs> hey, Dunkaloo, Seduce, Masi, Toto, Hamzu, see CJ, see Elena, see Alyssa. Uh, I meant Rich, Dunkaloo, Seduce, <laughs> Masi. All three of you for participating and for sharing your experiences, your views. This was an amazing episode of Fanatsu. I'm so glad to have all three of you here again, completely, completely, totally planned out. And <laughs> and yes, so so again, thank you so much for all of you. And I hope, you know, y'all have a great day and that we definitely learned a lot. There were so many themes that that I, I learned just from this. You know, the fact that you just said, Rich, that just because you're, you know, you're there in the States, you know, don't mean that you care less than than Chamorros who live here, right? You know, and and that there may be, you know, perpetuating this division between the, the diaspora and the Chamorros and the Barriage, you know, let's do away with these divisions. We're, we're all Chamorro, whether you live in Seattle, Washington, San Diego, or or uh, San Francisco, and so on. And and I, I especially love hearing those memories that you talked about, about when you first came here to Guam or the second time when you went on those hikes and things. Because, you know, as someone who's just been who's been living here the whole life, you know, it's you know, there's a saying it's like does a fish know that they're in a fishbowl or they're in the ocean. You know, it's not until you're out of it that when you realize that, oh, I miss this. 
So it's similar to me when, whenever I go to the States and I visit family members, I'm like, oh, wow, it's, it's different. I'm missing home. So it's like the opposite or the similar experience, just opposite planes. So yes. So again, don't lose the Zeus Masi for taking your time and your energy for the Fadatsu podcast. Zeus Masi. <laughs>